My name is Christopher Price. I work for Ericsson. Um, I am a member of the CTO office and my responsibilities are very much around open source and, and strategy work. Um, and that's why I'm here representing Ericsson talking about FDIO because we see it as strategically important. We see it as a technology that we need to build around and, and work towards. Um, who am I then? I'm, I've been involved in, in networking for some time. Um, I was part of, well, I was the first Ericsson representative of Open Daylights TSC. Uh, kicked off the OpenFlow plugin work there with a, with a few others. Um, that's my fault, I'm sorry. Um, I'm now working in OPNFV, which is essentially a data center stack project, uh, chairing the technical steering committee there, um, and really looking at how do we accelerate data center technologies, how do we build more variety, uh, get more features, and, and, and essentially accelerate the capability of the data center for networking workloads and networking uh, activities. So that's me and that's what I do. And I wanted to talk a little bit about why another vSwitch. Um, first and foremost, a quick look at OBS from, oh my god, in OBS 1.10. Anyone trying to use that in a, in a data center that, that's trying to get traffic through, just it was, it was a, a roadblock um, to, to, hey, this is okay in 2.1, right? We, we have um, we have fast path now. We didn't have that to start with. We have uh, multi-threading. Um, you know, we have a number of capabilities coming through, which which essentially enable OBS to be um, useful in an NFV context. And if you if you read the blogs, OBS has gone from blah 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 to to um, ludicrous speed. If you read the blog, the the, the statement is that, that OBS has moved forwards into ludicrous speed. And while that's okay. OBS in release 2.1 is comparable, even better than the Linux bridge. So if you're terminating traffic, great. You get probably better performance than, than using Linux bridge. Um, OBS with DPDK is another area of a lot of development. Um, and that is sufficient for NFV workloads when you're transiting traffic uh, through an entity um, as a vSwitch. Then, then you can use the user space solution. Uh, and that works okay. In, in OPNFV, we have a, a project which is specifically targeting OVS with DPDK, and then we have a project which is specifically targeting performance metrics. So there is a project we have which is developing performance tools, which we run on a number of hardwares against OVS with DPDK acceleration uh, and against just OVS uh, kernel space. So there's a lot of work ongoing in trying to get OVS up to speed, trying to make OVS good enough, trying to make OVS fit the NFV workspace. Um, but still, why another vSwitch? Competition is good. That's the first thing we can say. Competition, we want competition. If we have two, then you know people are going to be competing against each other. It's not just a one-man race and so on and so forth. So that's a good thing. We need alternatives like open switch, open data plane, uh, floodlights, indigo. I mean, there are so many vSwitches available today. Choice isn't the answer. We have enough choice. I think what we need to look at is why is FDIO a good choice? Why is FDIO something that we see as being valuable? From my perspective, all of the options we have today are very much built around the same type of architecture. The industry said we need virtual switching. The industry said the Linux bridge isn't enough. The industry said, hey, look at this open flow stuff. The, the industry said, let's try and build around this. And so we have a bunch of solutions all doing more or less the same thing. So let's start another one. Why not? Uh, it sounds like a good idea. It's not really a good idea. Why, why would we want to do that? We have best in breed vSwitches. The best in breed already have fast path processing. The best in breed already have uh, advanced classification mechanisms. Uh, they already have multi-threading. I can already span them out. I can already get most of what I need out of them. There's not a lot more to be added uh, in, in the context of, of these switches. But all of them are purpose-built. They're there to solve a problem. They're there to be a vSwitch. They're, they're there to address what that, let's call it a vendor, uh, generally has started these, wanted to achieve. They generally have sequential, well, no, they have sequential packet, packet pipelines. I think we all know one of the things VPP brings is the, is a vector packet processing. Um, it's nothing truly unique. I mean, I could do that in another switch. It's not the end of the world to, to add that somewhere else. Um, and they're all feature constrained. 
So it, they go a certain way, but they don't have all the features. They don't have everything I might imagine that I want. Um, so really, what does FDI offer that none of these other switches offer? Not a lot <laughs> at the end of the day. There's not a lot that VPP offers that the other switches don't offer already today. So we need to ask ourselves then, why another switch? And this is really the question that, that we, we spent some time answering us to ourselves in Ericsson when, when we chose to be platinum founding members of this consortia. Why did we do so? Good feature list. Okay, it has everything I need. I can take this, I can run this, it'll work in the data center, it'll solve my use cases. Um, it, it, it seems pretty good. I have my layer two, I have my layer three. I have what I need. I don't have open flow. Um, and you have to ask yourself whether that's a problem for you. Do I need open flow? Is it going to solve a problem that I'm not solving here? Maybe. Um, I think the answer there really is maybe. I, I cannot say that there is something that open flow will do that I, that I need that I can't do with these. So there's a maybe there. There may be a gap that we need to consider. What else does it offer? Modularity. To me, this is the real reason why you would invest in, in FDIO as opposed to another vSwitching solution. I can plug in. I can develop something. Um, in my experience, just my experience, so I, I start with that statement. In my experience, we are standardizing networking features faster than we're implementing them in OBS. In my experience. Now, we can sit and say software is faster, standardization sucks, and so on and so forth, but what we see is completely the opposite. It's faster to write a standard and get that approved than it is to get something into OBS. In my experience. <laughs> okay, so what do we see here? We see the ability to plug in, to create new nodes. I can go to FDIO, I can start a project, I can say I need this feature, no one is going to stop me. No one is going to oppose me, people are going to welcome me, they're going to try and help me. That's a different mindset, and that's something that I think FDIO brings that, that other communities won't. I think the gauntlet has been laid with this project to the other vSwitch vendors. You need to figure out how to attract more people. You need to figure out how to get more features in, because we now have a community that is built to build new features. It's built to attract community. It's built to be scalable. It's built to be flexible. Um, it's built to do more than just be a vSwitch, which is what we as an industry need. Um, I won't go into the details, there are experts here who can talk through the details of all of this. What else does it offer? The Continuous Performance Lab. Okay, so now we have a project that has most of the features I need, wants me to come and add new features, and is going to tell me how it performs when I check in my patches. That's something else that you don't get anywhere else. So we have the continuous performance lab. When I'm building my features, I can write test cases and I'm gonna know how it performs. And I'm gonna know how it performs compared to other switches. You're gonna be able to run other switches in this lab as well. So it, it's gonna be very much apples to apples type comparison of the, of the things that we're trying to develop. So continuous performance lab is something that's gonna be extremely important. I'm gonna run into a VM, but I'm gonna get some basic figures back and then I'm gonna hit some hardware and I'm actually gonna be testing this thing out. Coming from OPNV, I see the continuous performance lab as one of the feeder functions. This is going to be feeding into projects like Open Daylight, into projects like OPNV. We're going to be able to build network topologies which, which are able to leverage the best performant type of network solutions for the scenarios that we want to deploy. We're really starting as an industry to take open source and make it useful when it comes to developing features and developing things which we can productify. How does it look from performance? It looks pretty good now. You know, there's wonderful pictures that show just how good it is compared to everything else. That's good, I believe most of it. Um, what I wanna see is, is how does it actually look when I do it? How does it look when I take this into my lab or when I run my network topology or when I run my traffic use cases? How does it perform and how does it scale um, when I'm doing this compared to my vSwitch? Every vendor has their vSwitch. Every vendor has the best vSwitch on the market. I mean, we, we all have very good vSwitches today. It's not that we're building something that doesn't exist. How does this compare to that which I am driving as a commercial entity? It's something that we really need to investigate and elaborate on. 
VPP has a challenge. VPP has to be able to perform as an open source project as good as everyone's commercial products performs. This is a huge challenge and, and the reason we invest in VPP is because we actually believe it can do it. VPP, it's not just another switch. Um, so I, I, I put a little bit of text here and this is really important to me. VPP is a rapid packet processing development platform for highly performant network applications. Sure, I can make a vSwitch, that's one thing. There are a bunch of other things I can do. I can do load balancers, I can do firewalls, I can do DPI solutions, I can do a bunch of stuff on VPP without needing to re-engineer VPP. Try and do that on any other vSwitch project. Try and approach any other vSwitch project and say, hey, I'd like to do this and this and this and this. Is there room for me? It's not that straightforward. Most of them are connected to commercial activity uh, and most of them are protective of their commercial activity. This one, not so much. So the charter of FDIO, create a platform that enables data plane services. That's the first line. The first line is, is the thing that attracts me the most. It's not just about making another vSwitch, it's about creating a ubiquitous forwarding solution that allows me to build applications that are compliant with vSwitching, which I can run in a data center or out in the network on white box. It's the end-to-end -end vision of FDIO that differentiates it. Who knows what the charter or mission statement is of any other vSwitch project? If, if you know, just raise your hand, I won't ask you to quote it for me, but if you know that there is one, I mean, actually go online and try and figure out what is the mission statement of other projects. What do they want to achieve? I haven't found any published yet. I haven't looked that hard, but I have looked a little and I haven't seen a single published mission statement. So what is it that I'm doing when I'm contributing to this community? Where are they going? Where are they taking me? What do, what do they want to achieve that's going to help me achieve? As a contributor, I mean, for FDIO, I know that. It's written in the charter. If someone were to behave in a way that didn't support the charter, I would go to the board and that would be resolved. If I don't have a charter, if I don't know what the community is trying to achieve, where is my recourse? Um, so another thing that I like about FDIO, it has an intention and is very open about what it wants to do. What, about, what else about FDIO do I like? So I'm an open daylight committer. So there's an open daylight project. It will be integrated. It will work. It uses honeycomb. So I'm going to be brutally honest. I'm not a big fan of Honeycomb. Um, I know what it's trying to achieve. If I'm building a vSwitch, I'm not sure I would use it. If I want a control plane which provides me a model-driven paradigm for writing control plane applications, then I might use it. I know it's easy to write applications in, in open daylight. Everyone's doing it. Um, it's really simple. In fact, the whole model-driven paradigm is, is, is emerging and evolving. I can take that to the switching layer now. I can build applications in the switching layer, um, which are going to use VPP for forwarding. And I can do that very easily using, using Yang models, which are going to expose my interface automatically using NetConf. So I, I have very little code to write to get a lot done if I'm, using, um, if I'm using Honeycomb in VPP. Mind you, the first application for Honeycomb in VPP, get it to work, make it a switch. Fine, fine. Um, I might preferably, well, maybe not preferably, it's, it's yet to be proven, but I might have just built a NetConf interface and, and be done with it, uh, rather than bringing the Honeycomb solution in place. It's there, it's probably going to work, and, and the statement that I make to the Honeycomb team is prove that it's performant, prove that it works best, and then I will stop asking whether it's going to work best or not. Um, but at the end of the day, what it provides is from OpenStack through Open Daylight to VPP, I have a stack. I will have a stack in the Colorado release of OPNFV, which means I can go out in autumn and I can deploy a data center with a fully integrated VPP forwarding stack from the start, fully automated, uh, because it's fully integrated through the stack. Actually, that's pretty cool. It is, it is the second vSwitch that I'm aware of that provides that ability. In, in open source communities like that. I can do it with OBS today, I can do it with VPP tomorrow. So all of a sudden I have access to this technology. And what does that provide me? It actually provides me with a VNFI reference platform for application development. So all of a sudden I have a full platform, end-to-end -end virtualization running in data centers. I can develop applications on that technology. I can bring them back to VPP. I can re-contribute them back to the community. All of a sudden, maybe I have just produced, you know, 
the best bridge for data centers that, that's, that's available in open source. And maybe I've done that with very little effort, but just a little bit of intelligence and a little bit of planning. The opportunities that come with this are, are very, very apparent and very strong. And this is something that I think we believe in from an Ericsson perspective, that VPP brings a lot of opportunity. It brings the right vision. It brings the right approach. It's yet to prove itself. Um, it's yet to really hit the, hit the mark. I mean, it's yet to deliver, for God's sake. So, I mean, we don't actually know what's coming until it comes. And, and once it comes, then we're going to iterate and improve it. Uh, and as we do that, we will see how it compares and how it competes with, with OVS um, and other solutions. It's not just about killing OVS. I mean, um, there are, there are from, from a networking perspective, VPP fits in, in my mind, to, to one part. Then I have potentially OVS or Linux um, and things like eBPF that, that provide other solutions in a data center. I mean, there is a, there is a map that is yet to sort of coalesce and land um, as far as how we approach networking in the data center. And it may not be that there is one solution. Um, but I think when it comes to transferring packets, handling throughput in data center and virtual switching, VPP is a great uh, solution for that. And when it comes to providing enough cores to do things like load balancing and providing enough cores to do things like firewall functions in line, VPP provides you with more cores to run the applications. And at the end of the day, that's what we want to get done. Um, so that's really all I have to say. From an Ericsson perspective, we don't have a product. We're not going to sell you VPP. We still haven't even seen a chip. Um, but we're very interested in seeing where it goes. We see it as, as, as a change in the ecosystem. We see it as a way to get um, packet processing accessible uh, and, and to be able to in, innovate and, and develop new applications and features very quickly. <laughs>